Good morning. Good to see everyone. My name's Ruth. I'm one of the pastors here. This is our penultimate week in our series on Luke. So we are getting to the end of the story. Um, I think probably most of us know the end of the story. Um, if not, then spoiler alert, Jesus is killed but comes back to life. Sorry if that spoils it for anyone. Um, you've had 2,000 years to read the book, right? So <laughs> I think that's kind of on you. Um, actually, I had a horrible idea that this whole um, spoiler alert thing might actually be a marketing gimmick. So I Googled it. And what do you know? Yes, you can buy your spoiler alert Easter apparel and various merchandise on Amazon after the service, should you wish. Hopefully you won't. <laughs> Um, the section for this week is chapters 22 and 23, covering roughly the last 24 hours of Jesus's life. Um, and this material is pre presented in six uh, different uh, scenes in Luke's gospel. Um, first in the upper room, then on the Mount of Olives, then at the high priest's house, then various hearings or trials, um, then on the road to the skull. We tend to know that in its Aramaic, uh, Golgotha, or the Latin Calvary. And then the final scene for this morning will be on the cross. This is a lot of very rich material, of course. We could uh, spend you know, weeks on any of these stories in this section. And most of us have looked at these stories quite a lot, um, particularly during the week before Easter, which often gets called Holy Week. Uh, and when we look at these stories during Holy Week, we tend to take bits from all four of the Gospels and put them together to make uh, you know, one kind of complete um, story. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at not just what is in the Gospel of Luke, but what is unique to Luke, what Matthew and Mark and, and John don't have uh, in their Gospels, but that Luke does. We know that the gospel writers, um, you know, obviously all four are telling the same basic story of how Jesus is arrested and um, crucified, um, but they present it in different ways. We know that um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke shared a lot of the same sources. Um, it's very, very, you know, almost certain, really, that Luke and Matthew had a copy of Mark when they were writing their gospels, because there's whole sections that are uh, verbatim. Um, and Luke almost certainly had a copy of another document of Jesus's sayings and some stories about Jesus that Matthew um, also had because they have uh, pieces in common. And then Luke had his own sources as well. So when Luke adds or omits details or when he moves the stories around, there's probably a reason for him doing that. And so that's what we're going to look at um, and see what's unique in Luke and what we can learn from that. So let's start with the first scene um, in the upper room. Uh, like Matthew and Mark, Luke tells the story of Jesus sending Peter and John uh, to go and get the Passover meal ready. And then Luke writes this. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant of my, in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine at the table. The son of man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. So in Luke's account, Jesus says he's earnestly desired to eat the Passover meal, and this meal will find fulfillment in the kingdom of God. You might remember that the Passover meal celebrates Israel's uh, liberation from slavery and oppression in Egypt. Uh, Moses led the people out of Egypt, and as we've seen in previous weeks, uh, Luke presents Jesus as kind of a new Moses, uh, leading a new exodus, an escape from a, an oppressive regime into the liberation of the kingdom of God. If you remember back in chapter four, Jesus passed through water and then went into the wilderness and fasted for 40 days like Moses. In chapter nine, he uh, produced miraculous bread from heaven um, like Moses to feed all the people. Then um, Jesus went up a mountain and talked with Moses as well as Elijah. And Luke, Luke alone says that they spoke about Jesus's exodus that would be fulfilled in Jerusalem. 
And then in chapter 11, Jesus uses a phrase from the Exodus story, the finger of God. And now we read that the Passover meal, the meal that celebrates the um, Exodus, will find fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So Luke sees a very strong connection between Jesus' death and the Exodus story. And we'll come back to that theme in just a few minutes. And then Luke tells us that, uh, about Jesus taking the bread and the wine and telling his disciples to remember him, something obviously we now do through communion. Now, this is also in Matthew and uh, Mark's account. But I don't know if you noticed, in Luke's account, Jesus takes the cup twice. Um, the first time he gave it to his disciples and said, take this and divide it among you. Then he took the bread and said, this is my body given for you. And then he took the cup again, or a second cup, and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We don't know exactly why Luke writes it this way, but it may be that Luke is combining uh, two different traditions here, two understandings of what communion is all about. In one tradition, the cup represents the blood of the covenant, like the blood and the exodus, the, the lamb's blood that was uh, used as a way for the people of Israel to signify their commitment to God. And, and we read in that story that God remembered his covenant, his promise with Abraham and rescued them. And then in the second tradition, which we read about in um, Paul's uh, first letter to the Corinthians, we drink from one cup to remember that we are one community, one body uh, bound together in Jesus. Luke also makes a few uh, changes, other changes to this story as told by Matthew and Mark. He places the bread and wine earlier in the evening before Judas has left to betray Jesus. Um, you might remember th that in last week's section, uh, we read in Luke 22, then Satan entered Judas called Iscariot, one of the 12. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. And now in the upper room, here is Judas together with the rest of the disciples taking what we would refer to as communion. And Luke says, the disciples began to question among themselves, which of them it might be who would betray Jesus. So Luke creates a sense that it could actually have been any of them. I think we often imagine, or I should say I often imagine, that um, you know, amongst the disciples, there were 11 flawed but basically good guys and one bad guy. You know, maybe he wore black or he sat at the edge and you know, kind of scowled at people. And really, everybody should have known that something was off here. But Luke says, no, actually, they didn't know. And, and Judas was not a fringe member. He was right there. Um, taking the bread and the wine with the rest of them. And then Luke tells us that the disciples start arguing about who is the greatest. Uh, Matthew and Mark also have this story, but they have it way earlier in their gospel. But Luke puts it here, showing uh, the disciples jockeying for position, even at this time when Jesus is talking about betrayal and uh, suffering and, and his upcoming death. And then Luke tells us that Jesus said this, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag and sandals, did you like anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. In Luke's account, Jesus prays for Simon, also known as Peter. He says Satan is going to try all of the disciples, but, Luke, uh, but Jesus prays particularly for Peter that after he's failed, he'll repent, he'll turn back, and will strengthen the others. And he goes on to warn them that opposition is coming. Previously, when he sent them out into the villages, people welcomed them, they hosted them, they fed them, they were glad to see them. But this is no longer going to be the case. Jesus here is calling his disciples, as he has done several times already, to hardship, to self-sufficiency, to persecution. No, Jesus is not here uh, talking about literally purchasing swords. The cloak was a person's most important item when traveling, especially in winter or in spring. This is a rhetorical device. This is not travel advice. 
Uh, Jesus is using hyperbole for dramatic effect. Jesus is not suggesting armed resistance. The way of the kingdom of God is completely nonviolent, courageously nonviolent, as we were talking about last week. It's never about taking up arms. Now, I'm belaboring this point because this verse is actually used by a number of groups here in the States um, to say that Jesus was in favor of people bearing arms. Uh, like this one, if you can read it, that says, it is not just a constitutional right, it's a biblical command. It is absolutely not what Jesus is saying here. But as we see so many times in the Gospels, the disciples misunderstand, they take it literally, and they say, we have two swords. And Jesus responds, that's enough. Now, not these swords are enough, because in the Greek it would have to be plural and it's singular, but that's enough. It's enough. Stop. Stop already. Enough of this. We can sense Jesus' frustration here. They still don't get it. They are ready to resort to violence, to taking up arms, despite all that he's told them. And Luke includes a quotation from Isaiah 53, 12. He was numbered with the transgressors. That verse in full reads, Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the, with the strong, because he poured out his life un, unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. And we see the bitter irony here. Jesus is innocent, but he will be executed as a criminal. And here are the disciples acting as if they are criminals, grabbing their swords and preparing to fight. They haven't listened to what Jesus has been saying. I can't imagine how heartbreaking that must have been for Jesus in these, these final hours to see his disciples acting this way. How dispiriting, knowing that time is running out. But as Matthew was saying last week, are we really so different that we all sometimes reach for the proverbial sword, even though we know that it's contrary to the way of love? So what are we to learn from Luke's distinctive contributions to this first scene in the upper room? Well, I think there are two things. At first, we are all caught up in a cosmic battle. We may not share Luke's uh, worldview about Satan um, entering into someone, entering into Judas, or uh, asking to sift the disciples as we. We might use different metaphors to think about the harmful, unseen forces, the influences that encourage us to betray the way of love. We might think of them in terms of the power systems that um, underlie our society, or the traditions and expectations that we were raised with or the assumptions that are embedded in our culture here. But whatever we call them, these forces are real and they influence, influence us, we are subject to them. And part of our challenge uh, in following Jesus is humbly recognizing that we are not immune to these forces and asking God to help us become more aware of them and more resistant to them. And the second thing is that the way of Jesus is always nonviolent. At a personal level, um, this looks like loving our enemies, uh, seeking their well-being, praying for them, uh, loving them. At a corporal level, it looks um, like many different things. Uh, and again, Jesus is not talking about literal weapons here. But when we see how this passage is being so misused in our culture, when 124 Americans die every day from guns, where 79% of murders are carried out with guns, where there have been 270 mass shootings so far this year, surely we need to join with Jesus in saying, enough. Our second scene is on the Mount of Olives, um, and we read this in Luke 22. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. So in Luke's account, there is no mention of a garden. Um, in the last week of his life, Jesus established a pattern of coming into the temple in the early morning and teaching there, and then returning to the Mount of Olives um, a little ways out of Jerusalem in the evening. So although Jesus is aware that he is about to be betrayed, he is not changing his behavior. He goes where he always goes. And then he tells his disciples to pray for themselves and goes a little further away and kneels down to pray. 
In Luke's gospel, Jesus seems much calmer and more in control than in Matthew and Mark's accounts, where Jesus throws himself on the ground and where he goes back and forth to the disciples three times. We don't read that in Luke. Then Judas arrives with an armed crowd of uh, priests, temple guards, and elders, and we read this. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. So again, Jesus seems calm and in control. He preempts Judas. Uh, he doesn't get to kiss him in this. He, he sees it coming and he's ready for him. And he heals the high priest's servant's ear. In all four of the gospels, we hear about the ear being cut, but only in Luke's gospel do we hear that Jesus then healed him. There are two things I think that are significant about these details uh, in Luke. First, Jesus is an active participant in the story. He's calm, he sees what's coming. He knows it's a fulfillment of scripture and he knows that God is with him. We see that from the repeated theme in Luke of prayer. Jesus not only prays for himself, but he prays for Peter. He tells the disciples to pray for themselves. And we'll see this theme of God's presence with Jesus continue into the subsequent scenes. And then another theme um, that we'll also see continue into the story um, is that of Jesus not focusing on himself, but focusing on others, continuing his ministry of healing, forgiving, teaching, comforting others, even to the very end of his life. We're going to look at the next two scenes, scenes three and four, together. In scene three, we are at the high priest's house. Um, in Matthew and Mark, Jesus goes into the house and uh, Peter stays out in the courtyard. But in Luke, uh, Luke places Jesus in the courtyard with him. And after Peter denies knowing Jesus for a third time, a rooster crows, and we read this. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. The men who were guarding Jesus began mocking and beating him. They blindfolded him and demanded, prophesy, who hit you? And they said many other insulting things to him. There's something about the mockery of Jesus that always gets me. These were temple gods. Uh, each patrol uh, was consisted of three priests and 21 Levites, priests and Levites. These were religious people. These weren't uh, common thugs who didn't know any better. Luke has a slightly different timeline from Matthew and Mark for these nighttime events. In Luke, uh, Peter denies Jesus and the temple gods mock and beat him before his trials have even begun. And then after those events, the denial and the beating, Luke has back-to-back -back hearings with no interruption, which uh, we see in scene four. So first, Jesus is taken off to a meeting of the religious council where he's asked two questions. He's asked, are you the Messiah and are you the son of God? And Jesus responds to the first question, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. In other words, you're not looking for the truth. You've already decided how this is going to play out. He responds to the second question, are you the son of God, with, you say that I am. And the council decide, well, that's proof enough of guilt. And they take him straight to the Roman uh, governor, Pilate, uh, where they change the charges to something that's more relevant for the Roman governor, a secular leader. They say uh, in the next one, they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment of taxes to Caesar and claims to be Messiah, a king. Now, the charges that Luke lists here are very interesting. And these charges are not in the, the other ones, the other Gospels. The word used for subversion is only used twice in the Hebrew scriptures. And one of them um, is in the story of the Exodus, as we might expect by now. In Exodus chapter 5, verse 4, Pharaoh accuses Moses of subverting the people by taking them away from their work, from their labor, from you know, making the bricks and building uh, the Egyptian kingdom. So in a way, this charge is actually true. The religious leaders are unwittingly admitting that Jesus is seeking to 
uh, free people from an oppressive regime, to lead them into a new kind of liberation, a new kind of kingdom. The other two charges, of course, are not true. Uh, we didn't discuss this last Sunday, but if you read uh, the section for last week, you'll um, have seen that uh, the religious leaders tried to trick Jesus into saying that people shouldn't pay their taxes, and uh, he got out of that trap. Um, similarly, uh, he hadn't claimed to be Messiah a king. Uh, as we just noticed, they asked that in his, um, in his trial, and Jesus answered, you say that I am. It seems that he also realized that that was a trap. So these charges are not true. And whether or not Pilate knew all these details, he declares Jesus innocent, but the religious leaders are relentless. Hearing that Jesus is from Galilee, Pilate decides to send him to Herod, who was the, the king of that area. And again, this story is not included in Matthew or Mark. And we know that Luke had at least a couple of uh, people or sources connected to Herod's court, because he mentions them by name. There's uh, Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward, that's mentioned in Luke chapter 8, and Menaean, a member of Herod's court, who later uh, becomes a follower of Jesus, and that's talked about in Acts 13. So perhaps one of these uh, two people shared this story with someone who shared this with Luke. And Luke has also foreshadowed this meeting with Herod. Uh, in chapter nine, Luke wrote that Herod wanted to see Jesus. And in chapter 13, he wrote that Herod wanted to kill Jesus. And so now at last they meet the king of the Jews and the man Jesus falsely accused of claiming to be king. But Jesus refuses to speak to Herod despite the fact that the religious leaders are vehemently accusing him while he's there. And so Herod sends Jesus back to Pilate, dressed in an elegant robe. And on the basis of this shared joke uh, about the supposed king, we're told that the two became friends. And then Pilate three times declares Jesus innocent, but the crowd demands the crucifixion, and so he acquiesces. So what can we learn about these unique features in Luke? Well, by stacking up the trials one after another and including the story of Herod, Luke makes it clear that everyone is complicit in Jesus' death to one degree or another. The disciples, the religious authorities, the political powers, both Jew and Gentile, the ordinary people, all of them played a role in condemning Jesus to death. But Luke also emphasizes that it was the religious people who drove the process. They were constantly accusing. And they were especially guilty because what happened was a fulfillment of scripture and they knew the scriptures, or at least they claimed to. They should have known better. Then we get to scene five, on the road to the skull. And Luke adds in this incident. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, fall on us and to the hills cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Here we see Luke returning to a theme that's been a major theme uh, in the uh, past few chapters, actually kind of the second half of the whole gospel. Jesus is warning of impending disaster. Oppressive political and religious systems, gross inequality, and this thirst for violence can only possibly result in catastrophe. And here is Jesus walking to the site of his execution, but his focus is on others. How will they cope? If this is how the world treats the Prince of Peace, how will it treat real rebels? Don't weep for me, says Jesus. Weep for yourselves. Weep for what violence can and does do and for all the suffering that it will cause. The scene shows us again, if we go to the next slide, um, that Jesus is continuing his ministry even on the way to his own death. He's still thinking of others. But it also calls us to weep. Not for Jesus, but for ourselves, for the brokenness of our world, for the horrors of war and violence, and to share in the pain that Jesus felt as he wept over Jerusalem, to recognize that we too are complicit, and to repent, to think again, and to commit to the courageously nonviolent way of the kingdom of God. 
Finally, we get to scene six on the cross. Here again, Luke's account has a number of distinctive features. First, Luke alone records that Jesus prayed for his executioners. In uh, verse 34, it says, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Jesus is loving his enemies right to the end. Luke also records the conversation between the two uh, criminals on the crosses either side of Jesus. We read, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus here again is looking to the needs of others, showing love and acceptance of sinners, expressing unshakable confidence in the kingdom of God. And then Luke describes the death of Jesus as follows. It was now about noon. The darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness the sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. Now, Matthew and Mark have Jesus' last recorded words as, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Luke doesn't include those words. He has his Jesus' last words, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. The line, into your hands, I commit my spirit, is a quote from Psalm 31, verse 5. And at the time of Jesus, it was uh, an evening prayer for pious Jews. And there's also evidence that um, it was, in particular, a, a bedtime prayer for Jewish children. Uh, kind of like how now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul will keep you if you were ever taught that as a child. This is what Jewish children would pray at night before they went to sleep. And Jesus prefaces that prayer with the word Father. Hanging on the cross, naked, exposed to shame and ridicule, beaten and dying, Jesus in Luke's gospel doesn't question God's presence with him, but rather he prays a childhood prayer as though he's falling asleep in his dad's arms. At the sight of this, the centurion, representative of Roman justice, again declares Jesus innocent. In fact, not just innocent, but righteous. And all the people... But the disciples and the women from Galilee stay and are eyewitnesses to everything that happens. And the importance of eyewitnesses will become more obvious next week uh, when we look at the stories related to Jesus' resurrection. So what is Luke communicating through these details that he alone includes? How does he view Jesus' death? First, Luke is very clear that Jesus' death is a crime. Again and again, Jesus is declared innocent. Pilate says it three times. Herod agrees. The criminal on the cross says it. The centurion says it. Jesus has done nothing to deserve death. And yet he is executed and everyone is complicit in that. Jesus died because the disciples failed him. They betrayed him and denied him and failed to understand his message. They still, still thought it was all about being the greatest and taking up arms and achieving your ends through violence. Jesus died because the religious and political forces, both Jew and Gentile, wanted him gone. Jesus died because the crowd got swept up in it all and demanded his crucifixion. Jesus didn't die because he wanted to or because God willed it. According to Luke, this is what humanity did to Jesus. But recognition of complicity leads to repentance, to new thinking, and that leads to forgiveness. We see that in Peter, who weeps bitterly and later turns back and strengthens the others just as Jesus prayed he would. We see it in the criminal on the cross. We see it in the centurion. We see it in the crowds who beat their breasts as they go away. 
And we see it continue into the book of Acts, where the disciples say over and over things like this. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The good news, according to Luke, is not that Jesus died, but that God raised him. And through recognition of complicity, people can find forgiveness. Obviously, most of the people that Peter was talking to weren't directly complicit in Jesus' death. They probably weren't even there at the time. But Jesus' brutal execution demonstrates the brokenness of all humanity. It should cause all of us to be cut to the heart, as it says in Acts 2, to repent, to rethink. And second, Luke presents Jesus' death as the inevitable consequence of the clash of kingdoms. Right from the beginning of his gospel account, Luke has told us that Jesus would cause conflict, that he would be rejected, that he would suffer. Simeon prophesied that when he was just a few days old. When he was still an infant, Herod the Great tried to kill him. At his debut sermon in Nazareth, the townsfolk tried to push him off a cliff. And it shouldn't surprise anybody because that is what happens to the prophets. According to Luke, death is further proof that Jesus is the Messiah. This fulfills the Hebrew scriptures. It brings about the new exodus, out from under the rule of violence and oppression, of jockeying for position, of greed, of fear, and into the liberation of the kingdom of God, into the way of love and sacrifice. Which brings us to the third point, that Luke views Jesus' death as an example to follow. Twice in Luke's gospel, Jesus says that those who follow him must take up their cross daily. I think sometimes we forget um, that taking up your cross or bearing your cross wasn't a proverb at the time of Jesus. It was shocking language. It was hyperbolic, obviously. You can't literally uh, you know, be crucified on a daily basis, but it would have been shocking language to die to your own rights and privileges and live the way of love, no matter what the cost. And we see Jesus doing that in Luke's gospel, taking attention off himself, even in those final hours, praying for Peter, telling the disciples to pray for themselves, healing the high priest's servant, interacting with the women, comforting them, forgiving his executioners, reassuring the criminal on the cross. Jesus stays true to his ministry all the way to the cross, all the way, right to the end. And perhaps because of that, Jesus never loses his sense of oneness with God. God is always present. Jesus prays through these events. He expresses confidence on the cross that paradise awaits, that the kingdom of God will come, that love will have victory over and beyond death. There's no cry of abandonment by God, but rather this beautiful prayer as Jesus falls asleep in his father's arms. We haven't had time this morning to read this whole section, but I hope you will do that uh, during this week. There are discussion questions as usual out in the lobby in hard copy and also on our website. Uh, I'd encourage you to download those. There's also a prayer practice uh, that you might like to try to meditate on some of the, uh, on the things that Jesus said on the cross. But whether or not you use the questions, I really hope you'll read through these sections and not just jump to the resurrection because we tend to do that. Uh, you know, uh, Easter gets kind of a, a rush and we, we want to rush to make things better again. But there are important messages here. We may need to weep, not for Jesus, but for ourselves, for the brokenness of our world, for our own tendency to get caught up in it all, to go along with cultural currents and unseen forces, even though like the religious people, we, we know better and yet we still get caught up in that. Or we may need the assurance of Jesus' unshakable confidence in the kingdom of God, even in the midst of suffering and heartbreak. The reminder that this story gives us that God is still present, that the arms of love are still there. They're always there waiting to hold us. 
We're going to take communion now, as we do every week. We have uh, gluten-free crackers uh, and uh, grape juice in the um, tables here and the table in the middle. And you can come and serve yourselves or you can take it back to your chair, whatever feels most comfortable for you. But as we come to take communion, let's remember those two interpretations that Luke included. Let's remember that Jesus's exodus is completed. The Passover meal has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here in our midst. We don't need to live under oppression. We don't need to live under a weight of guilt or shame or feelings of worthlessness or anything else that is a burden to us. Jesus has shown us a new way to live, a new kind of kingdom, the way of freedom and wholeness. And the eating and drinking together, even symbolically, also remind us that we are one body, one community, one family, committed to following the way of Jesus together. We are here for one another in this together. No one needs to struggle alone. So please come to communion. Everyone is welcome. Um, there are, as always, other ways to respond too. You might want to pray with someone at the back or write out a prayer and put it in those frames under journey and grow. You can also light a candle as a way of praying. Um, there's also a station for Ukraine at the back. If you, if you want to do that, you might want to make a financial offering or just sit and listen to the songs. Um, but as we respond now, let's just pray. Dear God, we thank you for coming into our brokenness. We thank you, Jesus, for staying true to the way of love, for not resorting to violence, for not getting swept up in all the, the forces that, that um, push us into looking after ourselves and putting us our own needs first we thank you that you stayed true to the way of love right to the end we thank you that you wept for uh, for us for you said to people should weep for themselves and you wept over jerusalem too um, that you were willing to enter into our brokenness so that you could give us liberation so you could show us um, the better way of living and i pray that we would be filled with your love this morning that we would be empowered um, by your spirit to live that same way, to live lives of love and self-sacrifice. I pray that you would give us hope, uh, the way that you had hope, even, even in the darkest times, that we would know that your kingdom is coming and that love will win the day. Amen.